evening and warm welcome to all webinar of the Trishur Management Association on managerial effectiveness by our Professor N. Devichandran. Our beloved Chief Guest, Professor N. Devichandran, former Director of IM Indo, Senior Vice President, Dr. V. M. Xavier, Honorary Secretary, Sijo Pono, Vice President, Engineer Vinod Manjala, Joint Secretary Pradab Gorki, Treasurer Manoj Kumar, Galaxy of Past Presidents of TMA, Managing Committee members, members of TMA, students, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are all moving through the challenging and toughest time, an extraordinary and unprecedented time under the grip of coronavirus. The number of infected cases is increasing alarmingly, especially in Kerala. The number of cases reported from Trishu is much more compared to any other districts in Kerala. We have to follow the appropriate COVID behavior, like wearing masks, maintaining social distance, and regularly washing our hands, and so on. This will certainly curb the spread of this invisible virus. Most of our market area in and around Trishur is now under containment zone. We have to follow the appropriate COVID behavior to save guard our stakeholders, employees, customers, and so on. During these past days, the fatality rate is also increasing. It is said that if you are admitted into private hospital for treatment, uh, some of my uh, friends who is admitted in hospital is saying that we may need to spend lack of rupees for the treatment. So don't take this pan pandemic as silly. We have to take precautions to contain this virus. This may be one of the worst hit pandemic in this century. Most of the business disrupted due to the impact of coronavirus may be in the form of lockdown and related restrictions or otherwise some supply chain issues, demand is reduced and so on. Government is trying to boost the economy by various monetary as well as non-monetary measures. Some relaxation in tax compliances, moratorium to the repayment of interest, alpha self rely to boost the domestic industries. It is really a testing time for managers to show their effectiveness, managerial effectiveness. You can take the example of Reliance. Reliance is able to create, generate value for the stakeholders. Now its market capitalization is around 10 lakh pro. At the same time, many other companies are struggling to survive. Now we are going to discuss most sought after topic, which is relevant for the risk, managerial effectiveness. And today we are very fortunate to have an eminent faculty, academician, none other than Professor and David Chandran today with us. He will deliberate on the topic, managerial effectiveness. I am trying to get Professor and David Chandran to address our members, as mentioned by Dr. V. M. Sevier for the last couple of years. Now, when I contacted him through my close friend, C.A.K. Palpinabin, he regularly agreed to address us. I am sure he will go through the length and breadth of the subject, and certainly he will share his rich experience with us. Earlier in the month, in this month, September, he addressed our delegates in one of our faculty development program, mm -hmm. which we are organized in collaboration with the Case Research Society of India. Case analysis and discussion. He addressed our delegates how to use the case studies in management education by teachers. So one of the best speech I have heard ever. He already introduced by our senior Vice President Dr. V. M. Xavier, still I am spotlighting some of his achievements for the sake of our members. 
he joined in IIM Ahmedabad in 1980, and he taught several courses in broad area decision science, operational management, and so on. And later, he served as a director in IIM Indore. His transformational leadership to enhance the impact and purpose of the institution. He taught extensively in European institutions and had several visiting positions. He is a founder of Case Research Society of India, a non profit organization created to promote case based teaching in Indian business schools. The other NGO Nonprofit Managed Research Foundation created by him works in capacity building of teachers and focuses on doing research is under research areas. He retired from IM Ahmedabad, then he joined Manipal Group of Institution focused on executing education. Dr. Devijandran is passionate about exploring the relevant ancient and Indian literature and modern management. During his tenure as a director in IM Indore, he credited with a rapid creation of world-class infrastructure for the IM Indore. He also introduced the PGP at Hassan Kaimain UAE and the PGP at Mumbai. His idea behind the PGP program in this area to meet the demand for skilled managers in the Gulf region. The motive to start PGP in Mumbai is to help IM Indo to connect with the finance and consulting industry. I am not standing in between you and Professor Devijendran. I know we are all eagerly waiting to hear from Professor Devijendran on managerial effectiveness. I wish everyone a very fruitful session ahead. Once again, warm welcome to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I request Professor Rain Devijendran to address our members. Good evening to all of you. I hope I am audible and um, uh, I can Good see audience. my picture. Therefore, you must be able to see my picture as well. Yes. Uh, yes. First of all, I must um, thank um, uh, CA Sony uh, for his uh, kindness and for his generosity to sort of you know, invite me to this, uh, this, uh, this evening's conversation. Happy to be here. I'm also very thankful to the senior management team of uh, Trishur Management Association uh, for uh, for giving me such a warm welcome and uh, also <clears throat> also sort of accepting me as I am. I see that a large number of people have sort of no signed up for the webinar and I hope I don't disappoint them on the evening. I also see my close friends, Mr. Padmanabhan, Jayashri, uh, Meera, and also uh, another gentleman uh, who is working in a management school. I, I'm trying to get Mr. Agar, uh, no, it's not Agarwal. Uh, he is, uh, he, yes, uh, Mr. Jo uh, Mr. Uh, uh, George, uh, who is working with the, with the management school in Trishore. So these are all very well-known friends, and I'm very happy that they could uh, they have taken time out of um, uh, their, this, their, their schedule. Uh, this gentleman is working as a director in Shahadri Institute uh, in, uh, in Trishore, and um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see some of these friends and um, several things have been said about me. I may not deserve all that. I know a little bit here and there. I will share with you whatever little I know. And uh, if these ideas are... Uh, today, I have sort of you know, decided to keep this conversation a little bit rational and cerebral and not necessarily emotional. And uh, because it's a very senior management team and also in some sense, it's a celebration of the, of the, the completion of the term of the... Uh, management team led by uh, Sony CA Sony CL. Uh, I think it's an opportunity to be intellectually engaged, and the idea was sort of no uh, to position it like that. This is the idea, and um, I was very I'm, I'm I'm very happy and delighted to be here. So let me sort of no begin this conversation. I'm told that I have something like 40 minutes, and possibly another 10 15 minutes for question and answers. So if you have something in between to say, you can send that in the chat box, and we'll be happy to. Uh, sort of respond to you depending on how it uh, how it goes. Okay. <clears throat> the topic I've chosen is a little bit funny <clears throat> because uh, 
nobody talks about effective management because the whole world is excited about uh, efficiency and large volume of money. Uh, if you are a businessman, you are interested in large volume of money because turnover is very important. Gross margins are important. Profitability is important. Shareholders value is important. And nothing else is important. If you can manage this, it doesn't matter what you do. And nobody asks what are you doing and what are you supposed to do it does not matter. Even if you are running a management school today, the question that the parents ask is, what percentage of students get placed and what is the package? This is the question they ask in the first year of the program, of an undergraduate program. Forget about the postgraduate program. So nobody is asking what are you going to teach? How are you going to make my children, my child a little better? What value addition you can create? Nobody is interested. What people are interested is can you get a job? The end results are more important than the process. Can you get a can you tell me what is the package? Is it 10 lakhs, 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 5 lakhs, 7 lakhs, 3 lakhs? Whatever it is. Don't tell me that number. I'm interested in that number because I'm not interested in educating my son. I'm interested in investing him, like investing in a cow or a buffalo, so that I can eventually milk that cow or a buffalo when he is out of the system. This, I think, is the attitude over a period of time. So in that kind of an environment, talking about effectiveness may be a little bit of a difficulty, but we will try. The, I would, I would start with a very couple of uh, theoretical constructs, but then I'll give you some examples so that we understand what we are really talking about. To cut a long story short, no matter what our opinions are, the Swachh Bharat Abhijyan has been a resounding success in this country. Because, no, yeah, there are, I mean, still there is a long way to go because we can always point out a road in Trishur or a road in my village and say, you know, how dirty it is. Swachh Bharat has no meaning. But I think the fact is it has completely revolutionized the thinking of the people towards uh, clean sanitation and clean habits, like, you know. Uh, but essentially, the Swachh Bharat Abhijyan has been implemented in a decentralized way. It did not worry about efficiency, it worried about effectiveness. I think that, I think, is the, is the cornerstone of the entire conversation that I want to have with you. So let me build this a little bit systematically so that you are able to appreciate what I am really, really talking about. Similarly, for example, when Mahatma Gandhi... Uh, th thought about the rural management or panchayat based management, he was essentially talking about efficiency. Uh, he was not talking about efficiency, he was talking about effectiveness. Because it is a village which will know, understand the dynamics of the village. It is a village which will understand village, village management, village management, the president, village officer. These people will understand uh, Tashidar, Talati, Mamaldar. These are the people who will understand. Um, what are the dynamics of the village and what would make sense for the village. So I think Mahatma Gandhi's idea was like, you know, managing it through the villages, managing it through the Gram Panchayat or Panchayat Raj is an amazing way of building macro efficiency through micro effectiveness. This, I think, is dramatically important. So I think uh, that's the second example which we can quote and then we'll move on to, um, I will build some trade constructs and then we can have a little bit of discussion on this. This is what basically what I'm going to talk about and uh, I will sort of build it in a, in a particular way. <laughs> business, every business, whether it is a for profit or not for profit, has a purpose. If you are the management of the Guruvayurapan temple in, uh, in Guruvayur, the primary purpose of managing the temple is to provide a unique and self-fulfilling experience to the devotees who come there. Nobody is interested in anything else. People are coming to the temple to have a good darshan of, uh, of Guru Ayurapan. And essentially, they want, to, they want to have that experience very enriching, satisfying, and fulfilling. If you are doing anything else, it does not matter. I mean, you can continue to do whatever you like. But if this is not met, if this core purpose for which the temple is created and temple management is created, if this is not met, we are only fooling ourselves. Therefore, every business, whether it is a... Um, for profit, for, for profit business or not for profit business or NGO business or a CSR business, it has a purpose. If the purpose of the business is not met, it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, it actually doesn't matter. You can just keep on talking about it. I made so many tons of money. Who cares? Like, you know, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, as somebody said, like, you know, uh, my, as my son, one of my children, uh, second, my second son says, like, you know, what is after all the money that you have? It's only a number in the bank account. So, and Gujarat, there is a kahavat. Whatever you have consumed is what you have earned. What you have earned is not what you have earned. What you have consumed is what you have earned. So, therefore, like, you know, money beyond a point has no meaning. But, like, you know, so therefore, one has to sort of understand shareholders' value, stakeholders' value, 
uh, rolling out this, mortgaging, like you know, uh, doing deals, bundling, unbundling, or mergers, acquisitions, all that is fine. But at the end of the day, business should meet the purpose for which it is it is designed. This, I think, is, is very important. Whether it is business or whether it's an organization, if you're running a school, the purpose of the school is to educate children in that area in the most sensible way so that they compete in the NEET exam and probably get the top 20 ranks. That, I think, is the purpose. If that is not meant, it doesn't matter what you do. You can come back and say, I have a world-class uh, infrastructure, my classrooms are air conditions, I have trees, bushes, I have this, I have that. Who cares? At the end of the day, are you, are you importing what you are supposed to import is the question. So if you take that view, business can be managed through, through routes. One route is efficiency, other route is effectiveness. Efficiency is an amazing, interesting, interesting dimension because efficiency is primarily focused on resource productivity. Whatever resources that are in the organization, man, material, whatever those resources are, they have to be productively employed. And if you do that meaningfully, there are ways and means of doing that. I'm not going to get into that. If you are good at efficiency, you will be able to reduce the cost of your operations. If you are able to reduce the cost of operations, you have two possibilities. One, the gross margin is likely to be better, or you have pricing flexibility. If the cost of your operation is lower, you have pricing flexibility. But if you if you are not under the competitive pressure, you can charge whatever you feel like and whatever the market can take, and the gross margins are better. So the efficiency is the core of creating larger uh, business, larger margins, and uh, and therefore uh, more profitability, and therefore more wealth creation to the owners of the business or who has founded the business. That I think is one route of running business. The other way of looking at business would be manage business effectively. When you, business, when you manage a business effectively, there are very exciting things that happen. The first and foremost thing that happens is every one of your customer is very satisfied. A satisfied customer brings in multiple uh, customers who can do business with you. So therefore, the, the direct measurable impact of being effective in whatever you're doing is your customer is satisfied. If the customer is satisfied, this would be the better way of branding your company or branding your product or branding your service. If you do this in a better way of branding your product and services, you can increase the sales. You can also increase the revenue by either modest pricing or premium pricing. If you've got a branded product, premium pricing is possible. If you, if you don't want to charge premium pricing, you can charge a modest pricing. In both the cases, what is possible is your sales will go up and therefore your revenue will go up and this will lead to a larger wealth. Now, this wealth creation may not necessarily be your shoestring wealth creation that happens in efficiency because people run after efficiency. People forget by being effective, you can make a lot more money than what you would otherwise make. Uh, in other words, for every rupee that is saved, if you can multiply it by five rupees of earning, I think you're talking about a very different game plan. So these are two different routes by which you can look at a business. And depending on what suits you, depending on what is your mindset, depending on what you want to do, you probably choose a path in which you want to go. Now, there are multiple ways by which a business can be evaluated, and I will just spend a few minutes on it because it's very important. And um, business is usually, usual measure of business would be uh, profitability, growth, and sustainability. And people will come and they will look at that very fancy ratios, and they'll say their cash flow is good, more liquid your company is, more solid your company is, and they'll come back and say you are reaching the potential, your revenue deflection is not happening, your revenue is increasing, you are growing, your gross margins are good, your EBITDA is quite all right, your depreciation is good enough, your investments are paying off. All that are performance measures which are measuring the parameters, biological parameter of a healthy individual. But the individual may be healthy, but he may be mentally sick. One has to figure out why that is happening. So I think that, that therefore, one way of looking at business will be through these measurable parameters. If you are going to negotiate a, a term loan of, let's say, 200 crores with a bank, he will look at these parameters and try and see whether you are eligible for that. And he will give that money or otherwise, depending on what the norms of that, of that bank and the industry that you belong to. That, I think, is one way of uh, looking at business. Now, some people come back and say, I don't care about profitability, I don't care about growth, I don't care about sustainability. What can you deliver to the stakeholders of the business, shareholders of the business? What do the shareholders get? If the shareholders' business value is very high, you are doing a great job. So we like it. So that's perfectly fine. So that's one way of looking at business. The other way of looking at business, I know that you know, some of the management institutions in this country, which are supposed to be government institutions, are sitting on a corpus of 500 and 600 crores, and they constantly increase the uh, annual fee. This is completely crazy. Okay, What are you going to do with the, like, you know, the 600 crores of cash that you are sitting on? You will make some buildings. When you make some buildings, somebody will siphon off the money. What is the point? 
so you can as well you know do it in such a way that it is good for the society is a matter of different discussion i don't want to sort of expand on it beyond a point the other way of looking at business will be that you know of course sustainability of the business is very important you have to ask yourself a very simple question what is the purpose for which the business has been set up if the trishur management association is functioning it has got an outstanding management team you have to ask the question at the end of the day not only the balance sheet it's good that cs oni will leave a good and healthy balance sheet that i think is very important but people will also ask what is mr sonia's contribution to the contribution to the community of trishur through the trishur management association that i think is very important if that purpose is not fully met possibly no we have a long way to go that's that's one way of looking at it now therefore the purpose is very important associated with purpose is the impact of your organization your organization should be able to make impact let me give an example of a negative example for example this zomato uh, like you know some of these companies just come and deliver food at home they do a great service because you are sitting at home and you are you are your teenage boy or a girl is answer i mean asking this on a mobile and the product comes to you in a few minutes in covid time maybe it may not come in a few minutes it takes some time but it comes to your home but you know you get a great meal that's what you think but it's a meal which is cooked and reheated and it's being delivered to you which i think is a lousy meal to eat that's one but that's a different if you are willing to pay for it if you are willing to eat that that's fine look at the negative consequences of this across the board like you know uh, one will argue there are a number of employments that is created at the cost of what 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 kind of stress what kind of traffic congestion what kind of pollution for every we are the very earlier people used to go to go to the restaurant and eat now we are bringing the restaurant to retail homes now there is multiple trips that are being performed who is paying for the cost of that is not very clear so the larger point is there are direct costs there are indirect costs there are visible impact there are invisible impact visible impact is employment invisible impact is environment pollution traffic congestion on the narrow roads and narrow lands of this country so if you take that larger view what is the impact of what you have done if i am running a foundation the first question i would like to ask is like you know if i am running the foundation called management research foundation how many teachers i have trained or how many teachers i have built capacity and what are they doing today how many under managed sectors i have addressed and what is the implication that i made to the under managed sectors and how this is being appreciated or otherwise this i think is the is the larger question that you need to ask what is the impact of your business operations to the society at large is the question that we need to ask the impact question will not be easy to answer or correlate if you are running a business only on resource productivity because resource productivity assumes that you know what is to be given and that is what people accept and there's nothing else to discuss there i mean if if you run the business through the effectiveness platform maybe you'll be able to look at the purpose you'll be able to look at the uh, look at the the impact factor of of that business that i think is the is the second point that i want to make i hope i i make my this a little bit clear like you know the first point is to try and say business can be run through the platform of efficiency business can also be done through the platform of effectiveness and business has to be seen in terms of financial parameters market share this and that etc those are operating parameters but business should also be evaluated at the end of the day when you do this many organization fail impact in terms of the purpose for which they set up and also the impact for which it is set up i think that that is that's the key now the, for example like you, know, you have to ask yourself a very basic question what is the purpose of the organization like nike is it only shareholders value is it only an enterprise or is it something else what is the purpose of an organization like simply fly which does not exist anymore what is the purpose of an organization like indigo why was it created what is the purpose for it created so certainly you should make money if you don't make money you cannot run the business nobody is saying you should not make money you should make money in the legitimate way but is there anything beyond that just making money is there anything beyond that profitability is it anything beyond that shareholders value is it anything beyond that gross margin is it anything beyond that revenue market share competition pricing is there anything beyond that that question needs to be answered i think that's very to me that's that's probably very important now <clears throat> now essentially there is something which is fundamental that has happened i want to spend a little time on it pardon me if i look a little crazy and a little bit conservative i thought about it very seriously before delivering this talk this afternoon so i just noted down this and i thought i'll just bring it up see yomia let's take a very simple example like you know henry ford created this automobile and he was excited about it as many of you would know when henry ford created this automobile called t mobile in those days he built that uh, machine and he built that in a in a in a warehouse or in a in a parking lot of his house which had a door and when he wanted to take out the car the door was smaller than the frame of the car you know what he did he demolished the door and took the car outside so that he can have a trial run and it was raining and he had a trial run and he was very excited the car is moving 
Now this man designed this car. It's a revolution in the mankind history. He designed the car in a very interesting way. The purpose was like, you know, can I make the farmer's life a little better? The farmers produce a lot of things in the farm. The farm produce has to be taken to the market and they are not able to carry it because of the volume. If there is an automated vehicle, if it can carry the farm produce to the market, it is good for everybody. So the, the, the entire business concept was tuned towards what can I do to the society to make life better and easier? Now, fr that from there, since I'm doing your life a little better and easier, I would like you to be, I would like you to compensate me. And that's how my revenue came. My, I did not do business for revenue. Revenue is the consequence of meeting your expectations. Now, I want to make your life a little bit easier and better. Now, you like it. And since you like it, you'll part with this portion of your fortune. That is that the valid share that I'm talking about today. What, exactly the opposite is happening. What is the opposite that is happening? I want to make money. That is very clear. How do I make money? By hook or crook. I come up with a product. I come up with a service. I do this. I do that. I do. I mean, all kinds of things I do. In other words, the, the, the fitment is very clear. The output is very clear. Output is make as much money as you can. Think of the product and services as a consequence of this output. Earlier, I was thinking of a product and a service. See, please understand. You know, if Narayana Bhattatri was looking for money, he would not have created Narayaniyam. If like, you know, Jayasaraj was looking for money, he would not have created such wonderful music. So the larger point is like, you know, a sustainable long-term uh, soothing business comes only when you put the purpose behind money. When, when you meet the purpose, money will flow. But we have completely reversed the whole thing. See, early days, doctors used to say, I will save mankind, I will serve mankind as much as I can. And I'll make a little bit of money. Today, doctors come and say, I'll make as much money as I can. I will save as little patients as possible. Earlier, the lawyers used to say, I will help the person who needs help be legally. I'll make some money. But today, people come back and say, I'll make money. I'll tell you whatever I can do. But it's, 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 it's completely reversed. This, I think, is a terrible thing that has happened to business. So we need to sort of you know, go back and see how this can be corrected. It is not easy, but I think we should at least recognize the fact that we are getting somewhere, somewhere close to this. Now, I mean, we can we can see a number of examples. Like, you know, you take companies like the aggregate companies, like Uber and um, uh, Ola. Like, you know, the kind of things that they do are very interesting. They are operationally efficient. Impact-wise, they are nearly zero. When you really need a vehicle, they will charge you three times X and call it as premium pricing or a, a rush pricing. Uh, and the driver will behave the way in which he wants. And if you're lucky, you will get a good ride. And if you're unlucky, you will probably get a poor ride. Of course, you can always rate, but who cares for the rating? The point is, I have provided an operational efficiency. I have generated money. The impact of it is yours, and that's your problem. You deal with it. So this, I think, is another way of uh, looking at business. I'm in a restaurant business. I want to make money. What ingredient you use, I decide. And whether they are good or bad, that is that, that is their uh, uh, that, that is their, that their problem, that is their choice. And that's the way it's sort of, you know, this whole thing moves in a, in, a, in a particular form. So I thought I'd just clarify this and like, you know, what is also, what is also Im important is consumer satisfaction is the fundamental for measuring impact and relevance of your business. If the customer is not satisfied, you are wasting time. You are simply wasting time, however difficult the customer is. As Mahatma Gandhi used to say, customer is not an intrusion in the business. Customer is the purpose of your business. If you do not understand this, and if you sort of mess around with this, probably the fundamentals are wrong. Now, I don't want to ask this question, are fundamentals important? In this country, there are multiple views. With the current government, fundamentals are becoming more important. In other contexts, in other political dispensations, maybe fundamentals are not important, but let's not, let's not get to the beyond a point, because we are not here to do politics. Now, I'm willing to uh, sort of now pause here for a few minutes to get your comments on anything that I said so far. I have only made three building blocks. The first building block was efficiency and effectiveness. Second building block was uh, uh, try and see uh, what is the purpose of business, purpose and operating parameters. The third building block was the fundamental construct of the business. Doing something to the society and making money is different from, I want to make money, therefore I will do something to the society. These are the three observations that I made. I'm willing to pause for a few minutes. If there are any questions, we will take that and we, then we will get on to some more examples as we as we as we talk about. Yeah, sure. Any comment? Any quick comments? Questions? I know that's slightly different from the uh, the conventional way of doing things because normally the speaker finishes the talk and then he reads his talk and then the question and answer asked. Here we can do it a little bit flexible, so it's not a problem. I am very happy to take some questions from you. Please go ahead if there are some questions. Uh, please raise your hand. 
or um, uh, you can come on uh, come on uh, uh, what of the skype unmute the unmute the video you can uh, if you have any questions you can unmute i think uh, the concept is very clear that's okay. why they are not uh, asking any questions that is one way of looking at it other way of looking at it they don't care so good evening sir so that is good evening good evening good evening sir uh, one small query sir uh, ah, the, right. the the way the siemens got into india ah. uh, the way they perform now do you think uh, in which category they fit into sir because uh, I, i don't know the background a little bit more can you elaborate that a little bit more uh the so the when siemens uh, uh, came into india they are, uh, they they were like huge so they, the the uh, performance was expected to be reach some to the maximum level of what uh, they are at their overseas or the global level but okay. in india their growth is not up to that level probably okay. they are they are into uh, stuck at some where where they they are unable to focus on the growth perspective they they are where when they mm. came into india Okay. So it is like getting into a new market uh, would be a better strategy for this kind of scenario, or identifying what could be the future needs will be the better option for this. Uh, no, I I I really don't know how to answer this question because in some sense, no, it is a um, it's a very difficult question. Um, what can we reverse the form uh, from efficiency to effectiveness framework? Okay, Padmanabhan is asking a question. My my dear friend is asking the question. let me see whether i can i can answer this i'll try uh, but before that let's uh, let's address this one this one this question is a little difficult because i tell you why uh, companies like now what is the company you mentioned like you know it's a french company isn't it yes. siemens company yes. siemens is a german company all right now they would have they would have done their their own analysis of india the market potential the growth opportunity the competition etc before coming to that and if they are not able to make enough money once they are here there could be 120 reasons because the competition would have been more strong than them them or their product offerings are not good enough or maybe the technology is not uh, appropriate and the competition technology is uh, more uh, more relevant to the uh, to the current context and the management is not good enough there can be 120 reasons as why this has happened and not happened see if the growth has not been meteoric uh, from the management from the board from the workmen from the operations from the market sales everybody can be can be given some responsibility so we don't know how to answer this question but my uh, i think uh, I, I, in some sense i can't answer this question because there is inadequate information about what is going on of course they have to rethink whether they want to be a part of this whether they are happy with these numbers whether the size is good enough for them etc that's a different uh, uh, different uh, game plan for them uh, i i i'm sorry i'm a little bit vague on this question uh, but um, but that's what it looks like but if you want to build on this maybe we can i can get some clue and then i can possibly expand that a little bit Um, do you want to talk about this a little yeah. bit more? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Sir. Two more uh, questions. Uh, one from uh, yeah. Alex, engineer Alex P. George. Yes. You can unmute and ask your questions. Yeah, yeah. I can see these. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Alex. Go ahead. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, I am actually uh, a corollary question to your topic. Mm. You know, I'm basically an IIT Madras uh, 76 batch. I am mm. Calcutta 78 batch. Mm, very learned and person. Primary, my question is: My primary uh, purpose of setting up the IMs uh, was to create managerial uh, um, managerial candidates uh, who would match uh, the best in the world. Uh, and if you look at the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties, uh, IMs created managers who were not just on par with the rest of the world, much better uh, than the rest of the world. Correct. But now with eighteen IMs and each IM taking about four fifty five hundred candidates, twenty IMs. The purpose of setting up IMs to give world class education has been totally lost. Mm. And the primary reason for this has been the pursuit of money and creating courses to generate funds rather than creating good managers. Mm. So in your course of your discussion, I would like you to. to reflect on this particular no, no, i will answer this question right away see yeah. uh, first of all there are two issues here i mean let's let's segregate issues which we can clearly understand uh, is it wrong to set up 20 management institutions in the country the answer is no yeah. uh, because there's nothing wrong in creating 20 institutions because so long as you can not just creating meeting i am i'm creating that you know see there should be some yes. organization where i'm coming to that i'm coming to that see number per se is not a problem 
how do you manage those institutions what kind of quality that you bring into the institution what kind of an organizational structure you go into the institution what kind of faculty members are involved in the institution that is what decides whether it is right strategy or a wrong strategy so number per se is not a problem see a country like america which is probably one third of our size has got more universities more management schools than what we have got so that's a, the, the one number doesn't bother me but the way in which we went about is can be possibly a question mark i think i i broadly agree with what you are suggesting because what you are suggesting is like you know the the output of these iims until about 80s and 90s have been reasonable and probably comparable to the best in the world but after 90s something terribly went wrong and we are not necessarily producing the high quality or high quality uh, people there are two reasons for this it requires tremendous amount of courage to have humility when your brand is very high it requires tremendous amount of courage and humility uh to to sort of no to, to have humility when your brand is held very high for example like you know, when 200000 students are waiting to write a, i'm waiting to enter your institution and your total capacity is only 5000 you cannot but uh, avoid a little bit of arrogance so this happens so then the whole process becomes like you know you get into iim so it's a golden passport to get a good job and therefore the character building personality building the ability to think rationality all that could possibly become a casualty this i think is uh, is an unavoidable uh, consequence of an excellent brand that we have developed over a period of time then like you know somewhere down the line these institutions want to have their own autonomy they want to have their own money they want to have a large balance sheet uh, and therefore like you know as you know most of the universities in abroad are nothing but a very fat non banking financial institution because they have such a huge amount of money at the corporates and they are the biggest investors in the private equity investment market so therefore somewhere down the line like you know this brand leads to premium pricing premium pricing leads to more demand more demand leads to premium pricing that vicious cycle gets into that or virtuous cycle gets into that and in the process i think the casualty the primary purpose the quality of education the commitment of the students the commitment of the faculty uh, the ecosystem that is associated with that all that it takes a beating this i think is the reality people may people may deny that but that is their problem but the reality is precisely this i hope i answered your question alex a little bit no and, i have uh, a small on. take on that Sure. I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, against I, uh, setting up more IIMs and giving give quality education to managers. But my my complaint is that you know, see, there must be some institutions where uh, the best of the best compete with each other to produce world class managers. Which dilution has happened in the case of the IIMs? Now, if you take Harvard or MIT or even if you have the premier institutions, their intake for the most premium program is still very limited. Yes. What ensures that quality continues to remain, and the best continue to come to that. As you, as a director of IIM, you are very clear. You must be fully aware that it was the peer group which made all the difference. It is not as much the quality of the manager input which is given, but the quality of the peer group and the ecosystem created by the IIM culture, IIM institutes, which created this high quality managers. Yeah, I so, don't you think it's time that IIMs, especially the ABC, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, and Calcutta, focused on this particular issue of having a premium program where the best, uh, where we produce world class managers. Yeah. Okay. I I sort of broadly agree with you, but let me put it in a slightly different context. See, to me, the size of the institution also does not matter. For example, like you know, we all know that Harvard is an outstanding institution, but the batch size of the MBA program is 800 students. So I think so long as you have base and means for which this can be managed and you can add value, that that's not a problem. I think the problem is probably. I mean, I don't want to be a, a kind of a counselor without being asked. The problem is somewhere down the line, like you know, we lost the focus on what are we supposed to do. and therefore there has been deviations at various levels and that is showing up in the final outcome so i don't see a problem with the number of institutions i don't see a problem with the numbers that we have in every institution and the same ecosystem can be created if you are committed and if you got let's say 50 good dedicated faculty members to do what you are supposed to do these institutions will also outshine i don't see that as a problem but the problem is elsewhere i think you I, you understand what i'm trying to hear it yeah, right because it's I a problem understand. is the problem of management it is not the problem of the size it is not the problem of the number of institutions see in fact i will argue from the government point of view it makes tremendous sense to create more management institutions because india is a vast country each management institution can accelerate the local development of the regions 
and therefore it makes tremendous sense to do that like you know but the way in which we do that could be a serious issue and that's what we need to sort of you know worry about and probably correct it also that 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 my take on that right thanks for asking yeah i agree with you on that yeah sure thank, thank you. you very much thank you yes. thank you alex p jones yeah, somebody wants to say something we will listen to somebody for a few minutes okay thank you very much that's a debatable subject in fact Um, sure. my question is directly to what you are talking so it's very clear uh, about the managerial effectiveness and the purpose as well as the impact when yes. you brought the purpose and impact i think that uh, points at it once uh, you talked about the example of henry ford designing yes. the car yes. can you just expand on that how the, it connected with the farmers and what is the real case on that so because he himself was a farmer and what he wanted to do was he wanted to take the farm produce whatever he was producing the farm to the marketplace and he didn't have a vehicle and so what he was using that animal driven vehicles and he found it very inefficient therefore he wanted to have a mechanized vehicle that is how he invented this because see the whole point is uh, if you do a product or service which makes the life of people better you are making a difference to the society if you are doing a product or service which only improves your personal wealth in a legitimate way forget about illegitimate way let's not get into that in a legitimate way then i would rank that as a secondary business not as a prime not, not as a high class business a high class business is one where you will be able to improve the quality of living of the people around you it could be kayer board if kayer board is doing something it is probably helping the farmers to do a much better life that that i think is the key amol amol is an outstanding organization because it improved the welfare of the people who are producing small quantities of milk this i think is a larger issue there it become cash rich company it has got a larger market value etc is a is a consequence arising arising out of that so therefore why business people are respected business people why bankers are respected bankers are respected they are well dressed business people are well dressed business people are respected why because business people is not only wealthy he is doing something by which the society will benefit by which the fellow citizen will benefit by which your life and my life will become little better this i think is the therefore make a little bit money but if we are reverse this whole argument over a period of time that i think is the biggest uh, biggest problem i think padmanabhan had a very interesting question i hope i answered your question sir a little bit of that uh, somji when if you need me we can dialogue that a little bit more later also on mail i will leave my mail as well as the mobile number we can certainly talk uh, yeah. padmanabhan had this question how do you reverse the trend the reversing of this trend is possible only when the people who are funding these organizations ask the question do you want to make money or do you want to make an impact if you want to make money then you go through one route if you want to make an impact you go through another route unless that question is asked people are put, put, putting money in the system see many times you no know, entrepreneurship is defined as an opportunity to make money i don't subscribe to that view entrepreneurship is an opportunity to make a difference to the society so that societal value if you put on the top end possibly no things will become slightly different that i think is the is the quick take on it we will have probably time for one more question before i move on to um yes um <clears throat> Yes, I think some people are saying some positive things. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, go ahead, sir. Can I uh, can I ask a question? Please, please, please go ahead. Yeah, so sir, it's not a question, but it's uh, basically subscribing to what you said about uh, Uberization of work. Just yes. yesterday, I saw uh, saw a documentary, Uberization of work, where the platforms were created to democratization of entrepreneurship. Correct. Now, what has happened that? Uh, if you look at the documentary in brazil the the drivers are working 10 to 12 hours they are not getting insurance there is no medical facility and okay. 25% cut is gone is gone to people so right. actually when it uh, if you actually look at the purpose was hmm. democratization of entrepreneurship yes. so that everybody get makes money but finally what has ended up the uber very few people are making piles and piles of money whereas okay. the drivers have been exploited that's right That's so, right. so the question here is uh, 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 maximization of purpose yes. with profit. <laughs> yes, I agree with you, sir. I think that's a brilliant question. But the answer to the question is very, very, in some sense, simple and straightforward. Uh, but it is very difficult to implement. The reason why that overestimation has happened, and some twenty percent of the people are making eighty percent of the money, and eighty percent of the people are living with twenty percent of the money. and there is no uniformity in them and the product and service that you get are very different all that is happening because it is a corporatization for example today companies like uber argue 
that I don't even come under the transport department control because I don't own vehicles. I am only a platform-based company, so I am not. You can't hold me responsible under the Motor Vehicles Act and the Transport Act. This is uh, that act does not apply to me. That's a that's a fi fight that goes on between these people. It is highly corporatized, corporatized. When it is corporatized, the fellow who is giving an opportunity, who has got the larger muscle, will get the larger share. It is like a lion hunting an elephant. It will have a larger share. The fox will have to settle down to a smaller, smaller, smaller share. The only way of resolving this would be to create a cooperative structure. I mean, a cooperative structure, not the way in which it is happening in some parts of our country, because cooperative structure is seen as the founder head of corruption. That's a different story. But if cooperative structure is properly managed, and if you and I have an equal say on the running of the company, on the benefits out of the company, like what Korean has envisaged, that model will make sure these kind of operations do not happen. So, so, so another thing is why not the government? Because the government has given some loopholes, therefore the people like Uber will exploit. Correct. Correct. Uber is not able to exploit, say, in Europe rather yeah. than. No, no, no. Even there, they did that. Even there, they did that. the fight is going on across the world. Like you know, you across. See, the whole world, the larger point is. Pardon me for my word. The thief is always smarter than the policeman. <laughs> okay. So it takes some time to amend the amend the appropriate rules and provisions, etc. Right? You know. Therefore, I think, see, a smart fellow will take advantage of what is happening technically. And he will say, the technically, this, for example, like, you know, I purchased a ticket to go to America before the coronavirus. Because of the coronavirus, the flight did not operate. I lost 2 lakh rupees, not even single pie is refunded. Then argument is, this is an unprecedented thing. We are losing money. We can't give you any money. Go and dance. I can go to the consumer court. It will take, I can do some remedy. But the larger point is, like, you know, people are not willing to look at this sympathetically. There is a loophole, and I'll take advantage of the loophole and be done with it. Like, it is a natural man, natural disaster. We are not responsible. You should take an insurance. All that kind of things come as a part of that little exercise. So I think people will take some advantage because that's what smart people are all about. But we need to be smarter in terms of regulation. See, I, I also have this larger view. You give me any rule. I will find somebody who is smart enough to violate it and get away with it. Unless there is a commitment from your, your internal consciousness that I'm doing it because I want to make my fellow citizens' life better. That, that I think, is, is very important. See, for example, now I'm retired, I'm teaching some courses in IIM Ahmedabad. I did some exams. What I did was, like, you know, I gave some model answers to the exams so that the people can see what is the right answer and what grades they get so that they can verify. And uh, one of the friend who talked to us, and I am Calcutta fellow, will know this. There were some group assignments. I graded the group assignments. I also gave the model answer. My course assistant asked me, she's a young girl, she's asking me, Sir, why are you wasting your time in giving model answers to the group assignments? Well, exam I can understand. But why are you wasting your time in giving group, uh, model answers to the group assignment? I said, no, no, it adds a little bit more towards the commitment to the course. And the students should know they have the right to know what is expected out of them. Therefore, it doesn't matter. It's a little bit of work for me, but I don't mind doing it. I'll do it. Now, unless you have this excitement, you will not get there. Like, you know, uh, nobody can go and stand before uh, Guru Ayurapan and do a great prayer unless he's committed. Even the Pujari himself, if the Pujari thinks it's an occupation, he will go through the rituals. If the puja thinks it's a great conscious building exercise, he will do it very different. I think that's the, that's the bottom line. So regulations are important, but regulations takes a backseat if the person is committed. If the person is not committed, regulations can be managed. You know, sir, there are so many experts. I mean, company secretaries, chartered accountants, cost accountants, lawyers, these, that, etc. They all tell you how to manage your life. So I think that's it's very important. No, no offense meant anybody because they are using the technical knowledge. But I think at the end of the day, you have to decide what is appropriate for you and your company and the purpose of your company. That I think is the, uh, it's a very difficult uh, proposition because uh, it is calling for an internal change. And, and that internal change is very important. I'm drawn to see many of my students at IIM Ahmedabad are drawn for entrepreneurship, not because they want to serve the society. They are drawn for entrepreneurship because they think it's a quick way of making money. Some people come and say, sir, I don't want to work for anybody. I can be on my own. But if you're on your own, you may make a lot of mistakes and you will become nothing after some time. If you're working for a larger organization, you'll at least learn something. You look at some people, then you start on your own. So these opinions can differ and then there can be a debate on this as long as we want. Sure, I think um, we, are, we are more or less okay and we can, can we move on with the second part of this uh, uh, little exercise that I wanted to sort of know, talk about it. Thank you. I sort of, uh, is it okay when, um, if I have the permission of... Um, uh, it's okay, okay, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, I sort of know in the first part of the story, I presented as if this effectiveness and efficiencies are 
two rails of the railway platform and therefore they don't meet but i think the larger way of looking that would be they are two ends of a spectrum now one end of the spectrum is efficiency other end of the spectrum is effectiveness the more effective you are less efficient you are the more efficient you are less effective you are this is something which we should be able to understand now let me let me put this in a in a perspective so that we get a sense of that and then we'll build on this as we go by if you want to be efficient essentially what we are talking about is you are talking about reducing the cost of operations reducing the cost of operations can be done in a in a rajasic way as well as in a satvik way if you do it in rajasic way you cut cost mercilessly across the board but if you do it in a satvik way you try and increase productivity across the board when you try and increase productivity across the board you are cost conscious you are cost advantages and you have the as i mentioned some time before you have pricing flexibility etc but efficiency in resource productivity in large operations comes only by discipline that discipline is non negotiable let me let me give a completely different example like you know when elections are announced in this country the collector is the king nobody can negotiate anything with him whatever decision he makes is final and if you have a dispute even you cannot go to the court because the election commission is the ultimate authority for anything you may be anybody you may be the cm of the state you may be the minister you may be the party president you may be this that etc nobody cares because election commission is given the responsibility to run the election in a fair and a transparent way nobody can interfere so you want that efficiency of running elections in this country i must empower this person when you empower this person fully certain amount of rigidity will come in certain amount of rigidity cannot be avoided if you are empowering somebody to do something completely according to the rules and procedure for example if you are a shop floor worker in toyota production system you can only take three only take two biological breaks you can't take five biological breaks if you are a project manager in lnd in a site you can take as many biological breaks as you want because lnd project site is not managed on productivity it is managed on effect, effectiveness whereas the toyota production system is managed on efficiency efficiency means if the line starts at 8 o'clock you jolly well show up at 750 there nothing negotiable you will not pass a piece which is defective to the next work station non negotiable you will not take more than two biological breaks non negotiable you will not stay away from lunch for more than half an hour non negotiable the components will arrive exactly 5 minutes before assembly non negotiable each one of the item will be will be tracked non negotiable so if you want to have efficiency efficiency comes with significant amount of uh, significant amount of discipline that discipline has to be respected and that discipline can also be seen as a rigidity if there is a 144 that is proclamated in your city you can't run around and say like you know it's a free country i will do whatever like you will get some lucky charge so certain amount of rigidity follows from that because the police officer is given the responsibility to ensure there is a law and order that is maintained and therefore he has to do his job in order to do his job efficiently he ought to be a little bit rigid therefore any any efficiency based system operates on tremendous amount of bureaucracy like you know any efficiency based system is based on rigidities for example like you know if you ever get a credit card from any bank and it is going to be delivered at your home that fellow will make your life miserable he will say like you know i want to see your photograph i want to see your id i want this i want that i send you otp to your phone number phone number only when you give me the otp i will deliver this document you can't tell him this is my office leave it in the office no sir i am supposed to give it to you personally can i give it to me the society chaukidar no can you leave it with my wife no because why he want efficiency he doesn't want the card to come back and he want to do it in the lowest price that is possible certain amount of rigidity will fall in other words rigidity and efficiency are the same two sides of the same coin you can't ask for flexibility if you want efficiency flexibility requires a different kind of a management style and therefore we have to look at things as slightly different now if you, the first the first like the larger point is like you know <clears throat> people do things assuming that they are doing the right things when they are not in a materialistic world uh, sir the question is not complete if you want to ask the question we will we'll answer the question a little later everybody thinks that what we are doing is correct otherwise no we will not do things but the larger point is are you are you what you are doing is uh, is also i mean like you know is what you are doing is also seen as right by others that is a larger question you i mean i will think that i am doing a great job but you must say that i am doing a great job or not 
and sony should feel at the end of the day comfortable okay this evening was well spent i may go home saying that i had a great job and you know nobody can talk like me etc that's all nonsense right now i assess myself is different from others assessing me and saying okay this was useful this was sensible there was something to think about that i think is a larger perspective but let's see should leave that issue there i would like to only say efficiency effectiveness are the uh, are two ends of the spectrum and any management action is a combination of this what you see is i mean like it is like a milkman uh, who is supplying you milk like those in the village i live in a village you now because of the covid situation so i get milk delivered at home from which is the milk from the cow and the milkman decides how much water he wants to add and how much milk he wants to have so predominantly looks like milk therefore we buy it predominantly looks like water therefore we may not buy it. so efficiency and effectiveness are blended in such a way some situations focus on effectiveness some situations focus on efficiency now if you if you are a doctor you don't look at efficiency you look at effectiveness if you are a hospital manager you look at efficiency not effectiveness if you are a surgeon you don't look at efficiency you look at effectiveness my whole idea is to save the patient whatever it takes i will try and save him if you are running the hospital that be a corporate hospital your your emphasis is on efficiency therefore what do you do even if the fellow doesn't need an mri take an mri because more mri you take more uh, asset is sweat and more asset is sweat more profitability that follows from that now the last the last theme that i want to develop i don't know how much time that i have it's about 7 uh, uh, 7:35 Another ten fifteen minutes. Ten minutes. Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, yeah sure. I don't want to cut the question and session because that's where I think we'll. Get, I'll also learn something. Uh, <clears throat> let me just sort of quickly give one or two examples to see how efficiency hides effectiveness in management. This I think is very important. Now, what the, the way to decide whether the business is efficient or effective? There is a much more, much more thing inside this. Like, you know, that inside thing is very interesting, but uh, the, no, no Western management talks about it. There is a natural way of doing any business. Now, I will, I'll, I'll come back and, and explain to you. For example, if you want to have a sewerage disposal system in this country, you can't have a centralized sewerage disposal system. You can't collect all sewerage to a central place and then clean it up and throw it away. It has to be a decentralized, sector-wise, ward-wise, some kind of a volume-based. decentralization is necessary this is what i call a natural way of doing business for example all of us are exercising our franchises in every election we are very proud of it our country is very proud of it our election commission is doing a great job but how is the election commission is exercising helping us to exercise this option by decentralizing operations kone kone mein election booth banaya hua hai no voter needs to walk for more than one or two, more than 1 km Uh, some and sometimes even less than a kilometer in the city to go and exercise the franchise because we don't this and i mean centralized voting system does not make sense it has to be decentralized that's a natural way of doing doing business if you want to make sure the elections in this country are effectively managed the franchise options should be decentralized and you need to find ways and means by which this is done so therefore the, the first question before we get into efficiency or effectiveness is ask the natural way of doing business Take the classic example of food corporation of India. Food corporation of India is a very large, gigantic company. Their contribution to this country is unquestionably brilliant. They ensure food security. They ensure food grain supply. They do this. They do that. They operate in thousands of crores of business. It's not a small business. There are senior IAS officers who are running the show. I mean, they have presence all over the country. It's a large, gigantic organization. Is this organization efficient or effective? The answer is neither. what is the primary purpose of food corporation of india to remove, to collect material food grain whatever is harvested in the field it is taken to the mandis and the mandis it is auctioned there is some changes in the new agriculture law but let's not get into that it goes to the mandi and mandi it is auctioned somebody is buying there is a minimum support price once it is purchased it is stored packed and sent to the central godown and stored there and kept there for long time in spite of so many rats this and that etc and finally it is released wherever it is required so what you are really doing is only transportation all through your life you collect the material bring it to the mandi from the mandi you pack it pack it to the go down go down to the retail point and then goes down the line why can't we think about this a little bit more differently like you know, there is an efficiency here there is i mean you try and make rate loads you try and negotiate the better rates for the railways all kinds of things you try and do but look at it just like a different way like you know why can't we why can't we transport only the surplus from the village after making provisions for the consumption in the village then what you are really doing is you are only moving that material which is very important and relevant so you start with the village then you start with the block level 
when you start at the block level, what are you trying to say? The village level only surplus will be transported. At the block level only surplus, surplus will be transported. Then you take it to the district. At the district level only surplus will be transported. Then you will be transporting a very small quantity as you go by. Now, alternatively, <coughs> it is also possible that you are short of material. If you are short of material, combine two districts, combine two blocks, combine two states and try and see whether the shortages can be managed. If you do this over a period of time, you are, you are developing a localized solution to a centralized problem. And over a period of time, what we are done is we are creating a gigantic structure which is centralized, which is neither efficient nor effective. But if you look at the effectiveness of this problem, see, please understand, food grains are consumed where they are produced. It makes sense to store the food grains where it is consumed rather than taking it to some other place and bringing it back. If you don't want to do the unnecessary waste of uh, waste of expenses, it makes sense to talk about what I said. Now that requires a lot of organization, that requires monitoring, that requires control, that requires accountability. If you don't want to do it, then you do a centralized model. That, that, but that's not a good enough model for, for the primary purpose for which the business is to be done. The business has to be done in such a way that it makes sense where it is to be done. The larger point is that my simple submission here is it does not make sense to take the surplus to the central location and redistribute it. It makes sense to hold the surplus in the same location and then accumulate it over a period of time, escalate it to the next level, and then distribute it depending on the requirement. So that suppose if I'm producing, let's say, 100 tons of paddy in one particular village in Punjab, if that village is consuming 20 tons of paddy every year, keep 20, 20 tons of paddy, only 80 tons get transported. Not the hundred tons get transported. That I think is the larger, larger argument that we are trying to trying to bring here. Now the other example, which I think is an amazing example, is uh, uh, in places like Tamil Nadu. It has been proven by Kamaraj that you can attract students to school if you provide them a meal. Because many children, many children do not come to school because they don't get a square meal. And if you provide them a square meal, they come to school. Now, what is the best way of managing this? It is a localized operation. Every school should have a kitchen. Every, every school should have a ration. Every school should have somebody who will do the cooking. Every school should have somebody who is accountable for it. This is the best way of managing this. Then if you do that, both efficiency and effectiveness will come in. Efficiency in terms of cooking, effectiveness in terms of taste, effectiveness in terms of product offering, effectiveness in terms of what is being cooked, how it is being circulated, etc. Et now what have we done? We have created, because we are not able to manage this, there are all kinds of politics, issues. How to manage it is a different story. I'll come back to that a little later. There are innovative ways of managing it. But since we don't want to even apply our mind there, we don't want to get into this problem. Okay, no, 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 it is not easy to manage a kitchen in a school. So what we'll do, we'll consolidate. When you consolidate, what do you end up doing? You ended up producing 10,000 meals a day in a large, gigantic kitchen, which is highly automated, huge amount of expenses, investments, excitement. 10,000, 10 lakh meals are produced, 1 million meals are produced every day, and they are distributed to the schools where they are likely to be consumed. This is a very centralized model. Does it make sense? To me, the answer is no. The decentralized model makes sense. Because we are unable to handle the decentralized model, we have moved on to a centralized model, which is neither efficient nor effective. The decentralized model would be low on efficiency, but high on effect effectiveness. Management control systems, accountability, making sure that it works, making sure the provisions happen, all that becomes very important. But that has to be managed. I mean, if you can't manage it, there's no point in talking about it. Therefore, there is a natural way of doing business. And when you forget that natural way of doing business, you end up doing something which is inappropriate and you justify it by saying it is very efficient. People come back and tell you that I learned the largest plant in Asia in my site. Utter nonsense. But for a very simple reason, economic skills is very useful. Economics of scales beyond a point is dysfunctional because there is a primary cost, there is a secondary cost, there is a tertiary cost, there is a raw material cost, there is a storage cost, etc. The whole lot of things. There is also a risk associated with the plant, something going wrong. So, how do we handle this larger issue? Therefore, we have to draw a line somewhere. Efficiency has got frontiers beyond which it becomes inefficient. Effectiveness has got frontiers beyond which it becomes ineffective. So we need to identify that frontier and combine this effectiveness and efficiency. Then you'll come up with good business models, which make sense. And they will help you to make profitability. They will make your organization healthy. They will help you to make impact and purpose. Many other things will flow from that. Atmanirbhar is an amazing example of that. Atmanirbhar is an example where you produce what is required locally and consume it so that like, you know, there is an ecosystem which is developed. You don't have to necessarily create a centralized system. I'm not disputing the fact that certain things have to be centralized. We will deal with them separately as we go by. The biggest other large culprit in this entire exercise is when your operating performances are good, when your operating performances are good, you forget about inefficiencies in the system. Who cares? 
Because operating performance are good, shareholders are happy, the board members are happy, dividends are declared, earning per share is doing well, market capitalization is fantastic. Are you doing what you are expected to do? Don't ask that question, it is irrelevant. So this is how many organizations get drifted. And the CEO is, is also moving in the direction because he is accounted for, accounted for the financial numbers. Now, along with the financial numbers, we should also ask this larger question. Are, we, are you doing what you are supposed to do? If you are not doing what you are supposed to do, what is the point in doing what you are doing? That question is not being asked. So many times what happens, you know, the, effect, the, 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 the effectiveness of the organization is undermined by the super performance of the organization. Now, the organization was created for a purpose. It does something exactly opposite and it makes a lot of money and everybody is happy that it is making money. And sort of, you know, you move around and say like, you know, this is the best thing that one can do. So therefore, the, the one, one possible contamination could be the financial performance. So the bottom line to me is very simple. You look at the way in which the business is to be performed. There's a purpose to the business. For example, Korean cannot think of running the dairy business in a centralized mode. It has to be a decentralized mode. It has to be a cooperative structure. It can't be anything else. He has to be effective. He can compromise on efficiency. Certain amount of efficiency can be compromised. So the larger question is, don't run around and say like, you know, so should business be effective or efficient? Ask yourself the purpose of the business. The purpose of the business tells you how it is to be run. If you're running a refinery, you can't operate in a decentralized way. It has to be in a centralized way. So that tells you whether you want to go through the efficiency route or effectiveness route. But make sure there's a tinge of this, both of them. 90% efficient, 10% effectiveness. 90% effectiveness, 10% efficiency. That combination you work around and see, then possibly you'll be able to satisfy the operating performance as well as the purpose of the business and therefore the impact of the business in the larger context. This is basically what I wanted to say. I'm very happy to take some questions and I'll be more than sort of now happy to get your advice, get your suggestions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sorry, sir, once again. For thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for your excellent uh, session. You have gone through the length and breadth of the subject. You have shared your rich experience in a short span of time. You are yeah. really enlightened and enriched. The way in which the business is should be viewed, the purpose of the business, how the society is viewing the business, all these aspect, aspects and how the efficiency and effectiveness of all them purely dealt in this session. We can say it is a wonderful session, excellent session. It's the view of the audience. Before uh, concluding, let me uh, request members in case you have any questions, uh, kindly put in the chat box. Uh, Past president of TMA, CA Dr. Shantakumar is having a one question. Shantakumar restricts imports. So is it effective? That is his question. Yeah, but you know, the point is now, Atmanarbar, yes, see, nothing is free. See, the larger question that we need to ask is, um, see, at the end of the day, uh, exports are very exciting and imports are also equally exciting. Now, why is that? America is not able to take on China it is primarily because of the trade balance. America is a consumer-oriented country. China is a producing country. The more and more the American consumed, the more and more the Chinese produced, and the trade balance went in favor of them. So in some sense, no, even if it is inefficient, I would like to produce it in my country so that the wealth created stays in my country could be one view. Now, up to what level this is acceptable is a matter of discussion. Now, maybe like, you know, see, uh, for example, you know, can, you, can, you, can you think about this? Like, you know, uh, in Diwali time, we get these lamps. These lamps are imported from China. What is the cost of this lamp? One dozen is equal to five rupees. One dozen lamps equal to five rupees. It is coming all the way from China. Now, you look, it's five rupees. But like, you know, he's doing business worth about 500 crores in that season. Where does that money go? Who, who, I mean, whom does it make powerful? If you are creating wealth, you are more powerful. If you are creating wealth, you are creating employment, you are making me to depend on you, all that kind of things follows from that. Like, you know? So I think the Atman Nirbar is possibly a mechanism by which this can be effectively stopped if it is carefully done. For example, like, you know, why should the car business should be corporatized? Why can't it be cooperatized? Why should the milk business be corporatized? Why can't it be cooperatized? Like, likewise, you can, why, why can't the, why, uh, the sugar cane business, like no sugar business? There are a whole lot of things that, I mean, why should retail business be corporatized? What is the big deal? 
I mean, what is the big deal? Like, you know, it's, it's not it's not very clear to me. Like, you know, what is the direction in which we need to go? But to me, uh, the efficient, the ability to produce something which is locally consumed at an at an appropriate price, at an appropriate quality, at an appropriate service delivery is probably a good beginning to get away from the uh, from the slave slaveness of people who are producing cheap products and dumping it on us. That's the way I would uh, I, I would I would I would say that. Uh, next question uh, is uh, what is your comments on vocal for local i think it's a good idea i think i mentioned that like, you know atman yes. vocal for local dono that ideas i think we should encourage it see let us not become fanatic and say everything should become local for example knowledge cannot be local knowledge has to be universal now i cannot say my teacher will come from the local community it doesn't make sense my teacher should come from anywhere Whatever that can be done locally with the resources available without harming the environment, I think we should promote them. We have to understand that with a, with a, with a different uh, orientation. We are not saying that no, nothing should come from anywhere. Everything should come from anywhere when it makes sense. But when it, not, when it does not make sense, can we promote the local industry, local initiatives, local entrepreneurship and see how things can be done. For example, like, you know, honey, honey bee keeping. Should this be local? Should this be centralized? Uh, goat rearing. Should this be local or should this be centralized? Fish farming. Should this be centralized? Should this be local? I think these are the kind of things that we are talking about. So I, we are not talking about creating a large foundry in a small village where the capacity of the foundry is half a ton. We are not talking about that. That's a different ball game. Thank you. Thank you, Virbhat, sir. Sure. It's a simply great session. We are all yeah, enjoyed and like me, You like me, therefore you say good things about me. I also <laughs> enjoy it. So. Um, uh, before uh, I think uh, Mira has a question. Is, yeah. Mira has one question, yeah. and also Krishnamurti has done one comment. So let me see whether I can. Jagat is also here. I know Jagat. I know Krishnamurti. I think these are all Padmanabhan's team. So I forgot that they are here. Uh, is it possible to have good to strip just effectiveness at all the time and shift to efficiency every now and then? And also, no. I think the question is. Uh, I think let me answer this question. It's an important question. Krishnamurti sir, this is very very important question. I think what is important is see. Uh, let's let's put it in a slightly different way. Uh, efficiency and effectiveness are together. They can't be separated out. But what happens, no? It's something like this. Like, you know, Duryodhana also had some good qualities. But the predominant quality of Duryodhana was hatredness and jealous. His good quality was he was, he was a great friend. So this, I think, is the key. So in other words, the larger point is like, you know, no business can run purely on efficiency, purely run on effectiveness. It has to be a combination. We have to identify what is the most dominant factor in this entire exercise. That is the key. And that could be efficiency or that can be effectiveness. See, nobody is saying efficiency is unwanted. Efficiency is uncalled for. If the business has to be run on a platform of effectiveness, you add a little bit of efficiency, that is icing on the cake. If the business is to be run on the platform of effect, efficiency, add a little bit of icing on the cake, that is effectiveness. I think that, 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 that combination is key. You need to figure out which one, uh, which is the, which is the, which is the uh, dominant platform. And everything else will move around the dominant platform. That, I think, is the, is the answer to the question. Mira had, his, uh, Mira had a question. I'll just go back to what Mira had said. Efficient. Um, the efficiency can be replicated and effectiveness is a tougher choice. Yes, uh, is that efficiency can be replicated? Uh, yes, efficiency can always be replicated because it is based on resource productivity. For example, like you know, uh, just give a small example. Uh, Mira, no, I know that Mira is a great writer. So you write. Computers have made your life a little bit better because you become more efficient. But if I'm also a writer, I can also use computer to become more efficient. So efficiency can be replicated. There's no question on that. But effectiveness may not be replicable because effectiveness is a function of mind. Efficiency is a function of processes, technology, and means of achieving something. Whereas effectiveness is, is a mindset issue. How many of us think that our customer is the king? Our customer is very important. That, that is the key. So, for example, like, you know, many of us do not answer phone calls. But some of us answer every phone call. That is efficiency. So that is effectiveness. But efficiency is answering those phone calls very quickly. Within 24 hours time, whatever that, that time dimension is. I think that, that's, that's the way to say that. Um, there is, um, yeah, okay. If there are any other comments, I will take that. There seem to be not much questions, but there are some positive statements, which is fine. Uh, um, okay, yeah. So the people are very nice. So that's yeah, yeah. 
thank you sir for uh, sparing your uh, precious time with us yes jagat is Before... here i can see jagat yeah okay soni soni can i ask one thing soni yeah, yeah 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 you can ask a question sure. uh, good evening my name is anand menon i would oh, just okay. an observation if i don't know if you would agree i believe no that problem. efficiency we should it will be within the four walls of your company you told about a foundry it's a large foundry in a village mm. and they want to deliver it in a very far place for example from a, a small town they want to send it to bombay mm. but to transport that costs more than something can which is imported and available in bombay uh, so who is who is responsible no 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 you are an efficient, right? efficient man will not be able to deliver and effective the cost will be dependent on a lot of other things also no i agree with you completely but i think i am misunderstood here i actually said you mm -hmm. do not set up a factory in a village that's what i said you do not set up a foundry with a half a ton capacity in a village that's what i said not a half a ton it's a big this given is a big one no it cannot be see when, when, you when, want when, to give employment to the rural uh, people no no it doesn't work like that sir like it doesn't work like that because we all know the cost of that is very high suppose for example yeah. you set up a 200 ton foundry in a village where there yeah. is no industry now yeah. which manager will go and live there which family will go and live there see that you have to build an infrastructure you have to build a community you have to build schools you have to build colleges you have to build transportation you have to build housing and you are doing it only because of the government incentives and the process you end up spending a lot more than necessary yes it does develop some amount of viability but my point of argument would be if you are setting up a large scale foundry it should be set up in the most optimal location where you can sell it absolutely absolutely yeah. not in the place where you are you see you are not running business for charity charity can be business but you are not running business for charity you are responsible for your shareholders now in the process i may do some charity depending on the context that's a different story but if you start this is the fundamental problem with most of the business unit in this country set up under the congress regime in the name of improving the backwardness we destroy the industry completely because you set up the plant in a such a, such a remote place it is impossible to go there and nobody is willing to go there and there are all kinds of issues that comes as a consequence of that that plant get into that beyond a point so i think the larger issue is you see business has to be done ruthlessly now whether even if it is eff effective business it has to be done ruthlessly because at the end of the day you are committed to your customer and that customer expectation should be met if you are running a business on an efficiency based platform that has to be done ruthlessly whatever is required we will do that value addition has to happen so i think that that's the point of view that i would take no, I, i agree with you and i agree with you 100% sure. but i'm just thinking of a visionary like uh, jamshedpur it's so remote yes. and uh, tata's built a village everything is rare and mm. efficiently they are making steel one of the most uh, cost effective but that steel when it reaches bombay it's mm. costlier than co korean steel which comes to bombay i completely agree with you because of the infrastructure this and that etc but if you just go back a little bit more uh, even the tata's model is cracking in its own way for the simple reason they have recently sold their hospital to a third party they don't want to run the hospital on their own yeah they have reduced the changing bit. Uh, yeah. the times are changing the number of employees from 90000 they are reduced to 45000 they are given a golden share to a large number of people they are no more talking about effectiveness kindness this and that etc it's a golden shake but the shake is a shake you know whether it is a golden shake or a silver yeah. shake it's a shake <laughs> i think things are changing so the larger point is we have to appreciate the fact that you are running a business you can't run a charity now tatas were lucky because their their coal mines and the and the associated limestones etc were available in the area plenty he went yes. and located the plant not because the market is there he went and located the he is a smart fellow he went there. and located the plant because there is abundance raw material available there yeah thank you so sir. i think in the com that combination has to be thought through i mean otherwise it won't work sure all right uh, thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for this great opportunity i enjoyed this as much as possibly in some of you and thank you for being with us and we'll be happy to sort of yeah listen yeah. to thank you sir sure. yeah tell me sir please go ahead okay before going to the formal vote of thanks uh, i have a small announcement the 31st the, we have a one more session by engineer arjun jayram he is from california batson systems a fintech startup and his topic is god on god's own country to silicon valley and entrepreneurs uh -huh. a youngster from uh, government ledger college to show how he reached to the level of uh, fintech startup in silicon valley he will share on that and also we will distribute the uh, business plan contest prizes in during that program the program will start by 7:30 from california he is addressing us on 
മോർണിംഗ് സെവൻ തേർട്ടി താങ്ക് യു പ്രൊഫസർ എൻ രവിചന്ദ്രൻ ഫോർ യുവർ എൻലൈറ്റിംഗ് സ്പീച്ച് ആൻഡ് വി ആർ ഓൾ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഐ ഓപ്പർ ടു ഓൾ ഓഫ് ദസ് ഫോർ ദ ബിസിനസ് കമ്പനിറ്റീസ് കൺസേൺ ദ വേ ഇൻ വിച്ച് വി ആർ സെർവിംഗ് ദ സൊസൈറ്റി ദ വേ ഇൻ വിച്ച് ദ സൊസൈറ്റി ഇസ് സീങ് അസ് നോ ഗോയിങ് ടു ദ ഫോർമൽ വോട്ട് ഓഫ് താങ്ക്സ് മൈ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ഫോണറി ട്രസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് തൃശൂർ മാനേജ്മെന്റ് അസോസിയേഷൻ സി എ മനോജ് കുമാർ ടു പ്രൊപ്പോസ് വോട്ട് ഓഫ് താങ്ക്സ് ഓൾ ടു മനോജ് കുമാർ really privileged to report a word of thanks for today's webinar organized by Trishu Management Association on the topic of management and effectiveness by Prof. N. Revichandran, former director, I am an intern, Prof. Retired, I am a god. Prof. Revichandran, sir, made a really effective presentation on the topic. We could witness a seasoned teacher sharing his rich experience with us. It was really excellent, thought-provoking and stimulating. On behalf of the Trishu Management Association, on all present here i would like to express our sincere thanks to professor andre vitan sir for his excellent presentation thank you sir it's my pleasure sir. Thank, thank you thank, thank you, you professor chelichitran uh, yes sir thank, thank you and uh, happy happy to be with you by dynamic president ca yes, sony cl continues yes. to, continues his great work and we would like to thank you ca sony cl for the great leadership and for arranging such a wonderful speaker for today's session i would like to thank dr vm sevia senior vice president and galaxy of past presidents of pma managing committee members of pma members of pma and all other invited guests and members for today who participated in today's webinar make a success thank you all good night good night bye bye thank you thank you professor jitran and uh, sure, all participants sure. for the uh, sparing your precious sure. time with us thank you thank you very much sure. bye bye look forward bye-bye. to see you bye-bye. in trishul thank, 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 yeah. thank, thank you thank you sure thank you thank you jagat krishnamurthy padu sir oh yes thank you we are all with yes, you yes, only thank you. yeah 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 thank you thank you mira ma'am thank you thank you sony sir it was a good one thank you yes. president thank, thank, you, thank you sir thank you sir thank you sony sir yes yes uh, sony it is wonderful and thanks beautiful thank you. actually yeah. excellent yeah. speech yeah thank you members from calcutta management association uh, part is berus management association thank you all for joining with us good with this we come to end of this webinar thank you thank Big you all thanks for uh, sony thank you very much thank you.